Howdy folks! Something slightly different for you today. Some of you may be aware that Wargaming are developing a new game, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with tanks, aircraft, or warships. It's a bit of a pet passion project for Wargaming's CEO, Victor Kisley. This is one of the games that he played when he was a kid that inspired him to get into programming. That game, of course, was Microprose's Master of Orion, developed by Simtech and published in 1993. The game spawned two very, very successful sequels, Master of Orion 2, Battle of Antares, and Master of Orion 3. Believe it or not, these were actually fairly good graphics for a turn-based strategy game way back in the 1990s, but it wasn't really the graphics that sucked people into Master of Orion, it was the blend of exploration, exploitation, expansion, and extermination that made these games famous, and in fact defined the genre. And so, when Wargaming got the opportunity to buy the intellectual property for Master of Orion from Atari, their CEO basically said, shut up and take my money. <laughs> and I can kind of understand where he's coming from. I wasted so many hours on these games back in the 90s. And when I heard that Wargaming had acquired the rights to develop a new version, I got very, very excited. Of course, there are dangers inherent in remaking a classic and fondly remembered game because people tend to remember them as being significantly better than they actually were. And that's actually quite ironic because what Wargaming are doing, uh, a very, very ballsy move. Master of Orion becomes available on Steam on the 26th of February. If you purchase the Collector's Edition, you automatically get access to Master of Orion Early Access, which is scheduled to last for three months before the game goes final. But you don't just get into the Early Access phase they're also giving away all three of the original games in the collector's edition package. So if you remember those games with great fondness, you can actually have a go <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and see how they stack up to Wargaming's version. They're basically saying, here are all three of the original games, and here's our version, all for one price. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> they're that confident that their version of Master of Orion is going to compare favourably to its predecessors. So, alright, challenge accepted. Currently, only six of the projected ten races are available, but they're all familiar faces. The Cylons, the Sacra, the Mershan, the Humans, the Alkari, the Bull Rathi. They're included at Early Access launch, with the other four races, including one new race, coming as Early Access develops. Whenever I played Master of Orion back in the day, I always went for the Cylons. The Cylons are the technological race. They tend to have much, much better research options available than the other races, while being physically weaker. Um, but that's all right, you just develop better weapons than everybody else and stomp them all into the dust that way. So, Cylons it is. And no, they're not that kind of Cylon. This isn't Battlestar Galactica. Cylon had looked to the stars above Mentar and wondered. Generation after generation, the isolated Cylon quantums strived to unravel the mysteries surrounding them, to add an iota to their combined knowledge. Now the time has come for the Cylon quanta to go beyond in their search for answers, to travel to the deepest reaches of the galaxy solve the enigma at its core. In case you were wondering, yes, that was Michael Dorn, Worf, from Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and they've actually assembled quite an expensive voice cast for this game. As well as Michael Dorn, they've also got Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker from the Star Wars movies. They've also managed to lay hands on Dwight Schultz, who played Mad Burdock in the original A-Team TV show, John Delancey, Q from Star Trek The Next Generation, Alan Tudjik, who I remember most affectionately as Steve the Pirate from Dodgeball, but most people will probably recognise him as Wash, the pilot from Firefly. They've also got Robert England, Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and Commander Shepard himself, Nolan North, is also lending his voice talents to the game. As is usual in this kind of game, you start off without a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. The one thing in your favour is that the world you start on is usually not completely terrible, but it's undeveloped, you've got no technology yet with which to develop it. The fleet with which you have to begin conquering the galaxy, and fleet is probably far too grand a term for it, consists of two completely unarmed scout ships which are good for exploration only, one terrible frigate armed with really, really bad weapons, and one colony ship with which to begin your galactic expansion. Now, at this point, you may be sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, this sounds an awful lot like Civilization, and, well, there's a very, very good reason for that, because Master of Orion has always unashamedly been 
civilization in space. Um, so that's a kind of a good thing and a bad thing because if you are a fan of civilization then you're probably going to enjoy Monster of Orion. If you're not a fan of civilization, you, well you probably already turned the video off at this point so I don't know who I'm talking to. But for the rest of us, yes, this is pretty much exactly what Master of Orion is. And that really isn't going to come as much of a surprise when you consider that Wargaming CEO Victor Kisley is probably the world's greatest civilization fan. Unfortunately, he couldn't get his hands on the intellectual property for civilization because Paraxis aren't letting anybody touch that. But Master of Orion, which is essentially civilization, except with lasers and spaceships, was available. And so he's getting to do what he always wanted to do, which is develop a civilization game, even if he's not allowed to call it civilization. And I'm absolutely fine with that, because it means I get to play Master of Orion again. The key to success initially in these kind of games is always to expand as much as you possibly can as soon as you possibly can, while being careful not to grab onto more than you can defend. And then once you've done that, dig in and start developing, start researching, and start fortifying. So, while my deep space scanners have detected some space pirates coming in, I've managed to get my first colony ship within range of a planet that, well, it's not ideal, but it's good enough and it'll do. And I do need to actually start establishing some extra colonies from which to push further on into the galaxy. So, we're going to colonize our first planet. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's not exactly prime real estate, but it's close, it'll do, and I saw it first, so keep your dirty, filthy alien hands off it. This one's mine. So, my first off-world colony's been established, and it's pretty crap. But I've got other problems to worry about at the moment, because those space pirates are closing in on my capital world. So, all hands to battle stations, I've got one crappy little frigate in orbit at the warp space jump point leading into my home system and we're going to take the fight to them. Three pirate raiders versus one frigate. When you do engage in space battles, you get the option of allowing the AI to just auto-simulate the results and just tell you who won. But it's far more fun to actually get involved in the tactical battle itself. Now, don't get too excited at first, because you don't have many options at the beginning. You just don't have the relevant technologies, you don't have the relevant equipment on your ships, and at the moment I've basically just got one frigate on with lasers and missiles. But those missiles are good enough to take out two of those pirate raiders before they get within gun range and then I can close in and finish him off with combined fire from the lasers and the missiles. And that was a fairly easy win. They're going to get a bit harder. Um, <laughs> trust me on that one. So, pirates kicked into touch, colony successfully defended. Now let's get some research done. And this for me has always been the fascination of these kind of games getting superior weaponry and stomping your opponents into the dust with them. Not overwhelming force, overwhelming firepower. And my first technology unlock has given me access to automated factories which are going to boost the production on the planets in which I build them, and neutron blasters which sound very impressive, but in reality they're only slightly less shit <laughs> than the standard lasers with which you begin the game. However, it does at least allow me to upgrade my frigates, and you can do that with one click right from the research screen as soon as you've unlocked the relevant technologies. Now, before we get further into the gameplay, particularly the ship design blueprint screen and the later space battles, which are absolutely glorious, I should probably take some time to start talking about some of the ifs and buts involved in getting into the early access of Master of Orion. As I mentioned earlier, Early access for this game begins on the 26th of February on Steam, and if you're watching this video on the date it was uploaded, that means tomorrow. On release, the game will only support Windows 64-bit operating system, although they are going to be rolling out support for Mac operating system, Steam operating system, and Linux over time, presumably with uh, different phases of the early access. Speaking of which, early access is scheduled to last three months, and they are planning to release a major update every month of early access. So three major updates before the game comes out of early access and goes live three months from now. What sort of things can you expect to see in each of those monthly updates? Well, for a start, you can expect to see more than six starting races. There are going to be ten races available in the game, and you can probably expect to see a couple of those races uh, get thrown in with each monthly early access update. Also, you can expect to see more than the currently available two victory conditions. Now, you can play the game through from start to finish. I have. It took me nine and a half hours. <laughs> 
and it was fantastic. Um, but at the moment, there are only two victory conditions. So they're going to be throwing more victory conditions in with each major update throughout early access. The two victory conditions that are currently available in the game are, what are called excellence and diplomatic. Now, uh, the diplomatic victory condition basically involves having everybody elect you ruler of the galaxy. And this is something that was in, in the previous Master of Orion games, or at least some of them. And you do that by any combination of making everybody really, really, really like you, or really, really, really afraid of you. <laughs> you can grease palms, you can bribe people, you can gift them technology, you can pay them into voting for you, whatever it takes just to get yourself elected ruler of the galaxy. But that's kind of boring. Um, the excellence victory condition, which is the one that I took, um, as best as I can figure out, appears to basically involve making everybody else extinct. <laughs> That's right. It's the old favourite. Kill everybody and declare yourself ruler of the ashes. But, yeah, new victory conditions are also going to be thrown in as the early access develops. I could see from playing through that the uh, conditions for a technological victory were already, you know, the framework was already there, just from looking at the tech tree, even if the specific victory condition itself hadn't yet been activated. So, again, these are the sort of things that you can expect to see get thrown into the game as the early access develops. I also appreciate that there are a lot of you out there who, well, the whole term early access tends to send you running for the hills, screaming and clutching onto your wallets, um, because in the past you've been burned by games coming out in early access, you've put your money where your mouth is, and then nothing's come of the game, the developers have disappeared with your money. You, this is wargaming. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. Um, the game is going to be in early access for three months. Once every month, they're going to be publishing a major update. And at the end of those three months, the full release of the game is coming out. You buy the collector's edition, you're going to get early access, you're going to get Master of Orion, you're going to get Master of Orion 2, Battle of Dentaries, and you're going to get Master of Orion 3. Um, and you're going to enjoy three months of early access while everybody else is waiting for the full release. I mean, this is not some fly-by-night developer we're talking about here. It's wargaming. You don't need to worry about where your money's going. So, anyway, that's, that's the whole early access thing talked about. Now, what I'm not going to do now is give you the complete playthrough, because it took nine hours. Rather, I'm going to concentrate on some of the more interesting of the uh, design aspects of the game, particularly ship specifications. Once you've unlocked certain technologies, a huge range of modifications and customization options become available for the ships that you're going to send into battle. The space battles, as we saw earlier, sending my starter frigate up against three pirate raiders, not particularly impressive. Fun, but nothing that we couldn't have resolved just by clicking the simulate battle button and having the computer spit out the results automatically for me. This battle takes place significantly later in the game, and as you can see, I'm not relying on frigates anymore. I'm just about to lose one ship. That's a battleship. To get to the battleship from the frigate, you have to unlock the destroyer, and then the cruiser, and then the battleship. And my battleship is just about to go down with all hands, but that's alright, because after the battleship, you get the Titan. <laughs> and I've got four of them left. Those enemy ships are bigger than the frigate that I started the game with. Those are all cruisers and destroyers, backed up by a starbase, but they stand absolutely no chance against four titans. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're not even going to get my shields down. Oh no! No! One of my titans has actually lost his shields, although they are regenerating and he has taken some hull damage, but I'm... well, nah, there's no way I'm going to lose this fight. Looks like all those enemy cruisers are down. And there's just the star base to deal with. The Titan, by the way, is big. But it's not the biggest ship available in the game. There's one even bigger than that. They call it the Doomstar. The first time I took my Doomstar into battle was at the planet Orion. Orion is a tough system to crack. It's guarded by the Guardian of Orion. And, well, the Guardian will make mincemeat of most early to mid-game fleets. But it's hard to argue with the Doomstar. And once you defeat the Guardian, you can colonize the planet Orion and also use the technologies that the Guardian used against you. And that basically makes you unbeatable. Look at this. Eleven Titans, and yes, that is the Doomstar. <laughs> Look at the size of that thing. That's no moon. That's a battle station. Damn right it is. I was actually expecting this to be a significantly tougher fight than it was, but I probably left it a little bit later than normal to actually go up against the Guardian of Orion. 
and uh, I don't think I even lost a single ship. There we go. <laughs> That's the Doomstar for you. Uh, Guardian nil, Cylons one. And Defeating so the Guardian of Orion Cylon unlocks Orion a whole bunch Orion. of really, really what nasty technologies. Death rays, black hole generators, quantum detonators, neutronium armor. If you're bad enough to take down the Guardian of Orion, you probably don't need this kind of technology. But if you've managed to get this far in the game, you're basically a guaranteed shoe-in for a domination victory. Now, if like me, you were sitting there looking at the Doomstar and thinking... It's a Death Star. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Well, yeah. In fact, more than you think, there is a technology that you can unlock later on called a Stellar Converter. And what that basically allows you to do is... Well, do you remember at the end of Return of the Jedi in the Battle of Endor when the Death Star was basically using its super laser to one-shot kill Mon Calamari cruisers? Well, it does that. But that's not all the Death Star's super laser did. And that's not all the Stellar Converter does either. If you can't be bothered with that whole orbital bombardment and then sending the ground troops to invade and take over an enemy colony and you just want them all dead so you can move on to the next system, you can basically turn that planet into an asteroid belt. <laughs> Doesn't leave you an awful lot to colonise afterwards, but it's one way of getting them to shut up. Well, I couldn't find the planet Alderaan, so I'll just have to settle for testing on whoever was closest, and that meant the Alkari. It was their own fault for having a colonised system right next door to a genocidal maniac like me. One super laser test coming right up. Hey Alkari, it's a nice planet you got there. Be a real shame if something nasty would have happened to it. I see. You are so hellbent on destruction that you'd forsake our trade bombs to quench your thirst for battle. Yep, pretty much. Fire the frickin' lasers! <laughs> now you will witness the firepower of this fully armed and operational battle station. Oh god, I've got to mop up his fleet as well. Oh, if I must. I mean, <laughs> I've just vaporised one of his planets. What are his frigates and destroyers going to do? Bleed on me? Here they come. Into the Valley of Death rode the brave... Well, I don't know. 30 or so? <laughs> Um, they're doomed, of course, but I, I don't want to be here all day. Now, I mentioned earlier that you do get access to certain upgrades that allow you to give greater tactical options in the course of battle. Now, that's a lot of little ships. If only I had something like a black hole generator, it would be capable of taking a bunch of them out in one go. Oh, I do. <laughs> get out of that one, Rommel. <laughs> I really love this game. It's seal clubbing at its finest once you manage to get a couple of technologies under your belt. But hey, it's not me. It's their fault for not studying harder at school. Remember kids, homework's important, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a couple of little buggers managed to get behind me. Anyway, uh, yeah, a uh, foregone conclusion, obviously. I mean, I've got a Doomstar and 11 Titans cruising in on them. There was no way a bunch of frigates and destroyers were going to do anything other than scrap my paint phone. So, speaking of those upgrades for your ships, let's have a look at the ship design screen. So, a bunch of different ships you can tinker around with the designs of. Frigates, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, titans, and once you've unlocked it, the mighty, mighty Doomstar. I actually really like this part of the game. Um, I love tinkering around with the various different classes of hull, and trying to get the most destructive equipment fitted within the confines of the space limit. You can see, for example, the Doomstar here has a space limit of 4,000 and everything that I'm trying to fit into the ship occupies a certain percentage of that space. So, run out of space and you run out of options to fit things that go bang and boom and zap and kapow. The things that you can do with the various different designs are limited only by the equipment that's available and your imagination. There's an equipment, there it is, the Quantum Detonator, which you unlock by defeating the Guardian of Orion. And what that does is when your ship explodes, when it finally gets destroyed, it goes up with a really, really big explosion. So, for example, you could take a battleship chassis, pack it full of armor, countermeasures and anti-missile equipment, and then stick a Quantum Detonator in it and just send it up ahead of your fleet, right into the mass of enemy frigates and wait for them to kill it. <laughs> and then sit back and watch the pretty explosion. There's all kinds of just 
highly specialized ship designs that you can come up with and and the only limit is the equipment that's available and what you choose to do with it and, and I love games that give you that kind of freedom to tinker and Master of Orion is definitely one of those games but sadly all good things must come to an end and as my jackbooted heel crushes down on the skulls of the last free race in the galaxy and sends them all off to the salt mines that is pretty much it for my mammoth nine and a half hour playthrough of Master of Orion early access I had so much fun playing this game. It really, really took me back to when I was playing the original series of games back in the 90s on, well, I think initially on my Commodore Amiga, and then eventually, at least by the time Master of Orion 2 came out, I finally joined the PC Master Race, and uh, I'm just really, really happy that Wargaming have acquired this intellectual property, and they're bringing it bang up to date in their own version of Master of Orion. It's available as of tomorrow the 26th of February on Steam Early Access, buy yourself the Collector's Edition. You get Master of Orion, Master of Orion 2, Master of Orion 3 and Wargaming's Master of Orion as well as guaranteed access to all three months of the Early Access and then the game itself when it goes live. I hope you enjoyed this video folks and I hope you enjoy Wargaming's Master of Orion. I know I'm definitely going to be putting many many more hours into this game and I can't wait to see what else they come out with in the uh, early access updates. That's it for today, hope you enjoyed the video and as always take care and I'll catch you next time.